for this morning, so let us now turn our hearts and minds over to our Father in Heaven as we prepare to worship our risen Lord and Savior this beautiful Sunday morning. As the light of Christ is brought into the sanctuary and the prelude is, is played, I would invite you to just quiet your hearts and your minds and yourselves as we reflect on why we came here today. Thank mm -hmm. you. of the world as we go from this place. 
be with us now as we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand if you're able and sing our first hymn, number 206. I want to walk as a child of the Lord. endures forever. Their horn is exalted in honor. The wicked see it and are angry. They gnash their teeth in the middle of the way. The desire of the wicked comes to nothing. The peace of Christ be with you this morning. And also with you. You may be seated. Scripture 
lesson this morning is taken from Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 20. Page 4 in your pew Bible, if you want to follow along. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trodden underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. Nor do men light a lamp and put it under a bushel, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven the law and the prophets. Think not that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until it is all accomplished. Whoever then relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But he who does them and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Here is the word of God for this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, may the words that you have placed on my heart and the words that will come from my mouth be pleasing to you. Let your word be heard and your word spoken this morning. Amen. So as promised last week, we are continuing our study of really the beginning third of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount of found here in chapter 5. And uh, hopefully you all did some of your homework and, and you read this whole sermon on the map, which is in verse, or in chapters 5, 6, and 7. And it, it takes us a while to, to really pick apart. And even as I was preparing for this, and, and it's something that I've heard over and over, salt and light. We are salt and light. Uh, there's some, there were some new and, and, and different things that I, that I gleaned from this passage from the Sermon on the Mount. And that is what's just amazing about God's Word, is that it is a living Word. And we can study it and read it over and over. And every time we can glean something new. So last week we looked at the blessing statements, known as the Beatitudes, and these were statements that Jesus really torpedoed into the crowd that was listening to him because it changed their view of who and why people will enter the kingdom of heaven. And later in the book of Matthew, we find the well-known statement that Jesus made in Matthew 19, verse 30. Many who are first will be last. And many who are last will be first. I know growing up with a, in a large family with five other siblings, this was something that was uttered as we were lining up for food to each other, just as a joke. You know, the first shall be last. But with older siblings, I, they didn't heed the word of God. But in this sermon... Jesus really points out in detail that it is not the elite or those who appear to be the first. The ones who appear to keep the law who will be the ones who enter the kingdom of heaven. However, it is those who earnestly seek after the kingdom of heaven. 
It is those who earnestly, in their belief in Jesus Christ and what he did through his death and resurrection, will enter the kingdom of heaven. There is a transforming mission in this sermon that Jesus gives. And what he asks of his disciples, those who follow him, and those of us who are believers. Jesus calls his believers salt and light. Two things that really aren't easy to hide. Right? If we add a little bit of salt, or even a little too much salt, we notice it, don't we? Salt really transforms the taste and flavor of, of any dish. Sometimes it, it enhances the flavors. And if you were like me growing up, uh, when we ate cantaloupe, you put a little salt on the cantaloupe and it just made the, the flavor more. Well, when I met my wife, she would put salt on watermelon. And I just thought, well, that's different. But because I, I never did it, because but it did. It, the, the salt enhanced the sweetness of the watermelon. And just as light, the faintest of light shines in the darkness. Light can transform our world. Often we can notice the glow of city lights right over the mountain. Or even when I lie in bed at night, there's a little green light that flashes in the, in the smoke detector in our bedroom that you would never notice except for when it's all nice and dark and then it sits there letting you know that the smoke detector works, is working. Sometimes I stare up uh, at that light and it just keeps me awake. So salt and light transforms really the world around us. And as salt and light, we should not keep that to ourselves, but we should show the world who Jesus is by really living a life that is rooted in the gospel. We shouldn't just be Christians to other Christians, or Christians just only on Sundays. We should be salt and light out there in a dark world. The gospel lesson today begins with these words followed by a question. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? So as we know, salt has thousands of uses. It is really essential to life. We need salt to survive. Sometimes we're told we get too much salt, and other times we're told we don't have enough salt in our diet. But if salt loses its taste, how can it be restored? This question really might be hard to comprehend. Does salt even lose its saltiness? And you know, that was one of the questions when I was reading this scripture that I really looked into. And to my surprise, I found out that it is possible for salt to lose its saltiness. So in this time that Jesus is preaching this sermon, most of the salt in that area would have come from the Dead Sea. And because it came from the Dead Sea, the salt was easily diluted with contaminants. So if there was too much contaminants in the salt that you bought, your salt was rendered useless. 
Jesus is using this analogy to point out that as the salt of the earth, those whom he called blessed are able to be used to spread his message. But if we allow ourselves to be too contaminated with worldly desires, we become ineffective as salt of the earth. We become ineffective to be essential for life and for preservation. We know that Jesus came to save the world, to restore those who had become lost by providing a way for salvation, to help those who may have become too contaminated, who needed to be restored. Matthew 5, verse 14, we see Jesus call out that he is the light of the world. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. It is because we as followers of Christ become light bearers that Jesus calls us the light of the world here in Matthew 5. But we are the ones who decide whether we allow that light to shine or we hide it away. If we are walking with Jesus and are the salt and light, it really is impossible for us to hide who we are. Those around us will see that we are different, that we have something to offer that the world does not offer. No one hides a light after lighting it. They place it in the darkness so that they can see. We also should lift up our light to illuminate the truth, to shine light into the darkness. We use light in many different ways, but maybe one of the most important ways that we use light is to really warn others of dangers. When I think about this image of us being light of the world, it draws to mind lighthouses. And I know my mom always loved lighthouses and when we'd go on vacation, especially up through New England, we would visit lighthouses. And on our honeymoon, Jessica and I got up early one morning before the sun rose and it was almost a perfect morning and had just snowed up there. Uh, and so you had snow on the beach and we drove up the coast to go to, I hope I say this right, Quaddy Head State Park. And up there is the Quaddy Head Lighthouse. And it wasn't just to see the lighthouse, but this point in America is the what's considered the easternmost point on the East Coast. So we would get to be the first ones, technically, to see the sunrise in the United States. So that's why I got her up early and we bundled up because it was frigid. And we stood out there by that lighthouse, waiting for the sun to come up. As lobster boats and, and all, the, all the things that happened before the sun comes out were, were out there uh, in the ocean. And it was amazing getting to see the first light of day. But lighthouses are there for an important reason. Nowadays, most of them are tourist attractions because of other navigational technology we have, but lighthouses at one point were instrumental in 
preventing boats from wrecking into the rocks. Lighthouses signaled that there was danger. It also gave hope to those who were in the darkness that they were heading in the right direction. They signaled where to go and what things to avoid. <coughs> and that's really how our faith is, isn't it? It's like a lighthouse that shines in the darkness. And we are lighthouses not meant for ourselves, but to shine into the darkness of the world. to really point out dangers, sins, and to help others find a safe passage, salvation. Certainly it is awesome for us to experience the light, just as Jessica and I experienced the first light of day that morning. <coughs> But we shouldn't keep that to ourselves. We should want others to go and experience that too. As Christians, we should, we should jump at the chance to share our faith with others. We should shine into the darkness. <coughs> we must allow Jesus to work through us so that others see salvation. continues his sermon here in verse 17 of Matthew 5, explaining that he did not come to earth to abolish the law, but rather to fulfill it. So if we study the Old Testament, we see that there are many laws that God's people had to follow. And there are 613 laws in the Old Testament. And then on top of that, there are many warnings from the prophets. And if you ever go into a study of the book of Leviticus, you might easily get lost and confused by what the purpose of all these laws were. And you might say, 613 laws, that seems like a lot. But I also researched there's Four thousand, over 4,000 federal laws that we have. So the Old Testament doesn't look too bad now, does it? <laughs> and on top of that, there are state laws and local laws. And I found out that on average, an American breaks three laws a day and doesn't even know it. But laws are important, aren't they? They give us structure. Some of the laws might not make sense to us. Some of them are just bad laws. And then we have politicians that create more laws to fix the bad laws, and it just continues on. And who knows by next year how many laws that we'll have in this country. But the laws in the Old Testament were not abolished by Jesus. It is important that we study and understand these laws because Jesus becomes the law. The Old Testament helps us understand why we need a mess Messiah. These laws did not disappear, but with mankind, we find ways to really separate ourselves from God, no matter what the law commands us to do. We humans are really creative sinners, aren't we? We are creative sinners in need of a Savior <clears throat> who is perfect and is the Word become flesh. The laws of the prophet and other writings in scripture is fulfilled through the embodiment 
of Jesus. It was the religious elites who boasted that they were the ones who kept the law. And they would point out other people who didn't keep the law. But in truth, they also were breaking law. And Jesus warns that those who break the commands and teaches others to also break them will be the least in the kingdom of heaven. But those who teach the law and shine the light of Christ into darkness will expose sin and will be called great. You see, we are all sinners. It is really easy for us to look around the room and, and point out, like the Pharisees would do, those who are not as perfect as we are. You might be able to find the three laws that your neighbor broke, but never find the ones that you broke today. And in this understanding that we are all sinners, we see the truth that no one is able to get to heaven on their own accord. Our righteousness must exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees. That's what Jesus is pointing out here. He's pointing out that it is really impossible without Jesus. The only thing that gets us into heaven is perfection through the blood of Jesus Christ. Because our own human effort will never be enough. As perfect as we may seem to others, we will never be perfect like Jesus. And we acknowledge this when we partake in the sacrament of communion. We acknowledge that we are all sinners. That even when we appear to be upholding the law and appear to be a perfect Christian in our lives, we still fail to live perfect lives. There are laws that we break and sins that we commit that others may never see. We understand that God, knowing that we were in need of a Savior, sent his Son to earth. Jesus' body was broken and his blood was shed and poured out for the sins of many. Poured out for my sins and your sins. And when we partake in this holy meal, that is simply bread and wine. We do this in remembrance of Christ's saving grace. And we do it with all who have called on the name of the Lord. All those who Jesus called salt and light. Whether their lives look like ours or not. You see what is great is that Jesus can see past our outward appearance. He sees past those, those failures and those walls that we broke, the sins that we carry and those burdens that we have. And he looks at our heart. To those who believe and desire a relationship with Jesus, God calls them salt and light. Sometimes we expect everyone who is a Christian to be the same amount of salt and light, don't we? But whether we are a little candle or this giant bonfire, God can use us where we are to shine the light of Christ. 
God needs people of faith to lead the way. To bring others in this dark world to Christ. So let us shine the light of Christ and to be the salt of the earth. For we do live in a world that is dark and tasteless. Amen. Now let us pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, I give you thanks and praise that you saw a need for me and for all of us here and for all the world to be saved. It is not through our words or our actions or the, the things that we can do that save us, but it's through the redeeming blood of your Son, Jesus Christ who saves us. I just pray that each of us picks up our own crosses and that we are the salt and light of the earth. That we strive to live a life that is in Christ so that we can bring others in to the salvation that we have accepted. Lord, I pray for all those who are lost and are in need of a Savior. May this church be a light in a dark world. That we are guiding others to Christ. That we aren't guiding them away. Lord, I just ask that you forgive us of our sins. Forgive us if we have looked upon others with disdain. Lord, let us be the light of Christ. Let us sing his praises and share our concerns with each other and with you. Lord God, we give you praise this day for a beautiful day. I give you thanks this day for Nancy's birthday. And we give you thanks for good health, for family and friends. We give you thanks for those in our lives who shine the light of Christ for us and to us. Lord God, we lift up these concerns to you. We lift up Martha Wise, Gloria and Bob, Anna May. We lift up Joe and Loretta, Carolyn Smith, Jean and Jerry Metz. Lord God, we lift up Pastor Mary as she continues her battle with cancer. I give you thanks for the, the help that she provided me this week. Lord God, we lift up Randy, Dolly, Dina Moore, Doc McAfee, Tom Leatherman's family, Anne, Stan, Joanne, Scott and Angela. We lift up Donna Toms as she goes through speech therapy and is back home. We lift up Kyle and Erica, Jim Burdett, Judy, Esther Toms, Jane Grossnickel, Allie Smith. We lift up all of those families of, who have lost loved ones. May you comfort them 
and give them strength. And I lift everyone up that's gathered here. May each of us lay our burdens down. Help us to be the salt and light. Lord God, we just give you thanks for our Lord Jesus Christ, who not only was the light of the world, but became the law. He became the Word made flesh, our Savior. Amen. <coughs> Now, as we prepare our hearts this morning for communion, may we stand as you are able to sing, Fill My Cup, Lord, number 641. And so, with your people on earth and with the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick and fed the hungry and ate with sinners. By the baptism of the suffering death and resurrection, you give birth 
to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread and he gave thanks to you, broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then when the supper was over, he took the cup and he gave thanks to you and he gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts, in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is Christ, 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 Christ. Pour out on, pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us that are gathered here, and on these gifts of bread and wine, and make them for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by His blood. By your Spirit. Make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory. And we feast at his heavenly banquet through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church. All, get, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For God is the kingdom, and the power, Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. <coughs> the cup which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. As Christians, we are part of the body of Christ, and we partake in the sharing of the bread and wine. We do so with all who are gathered here today, in the past and in the future, and when we are all gathered once again in heaven. So I invite all who are desiring to share this mystery of faith to partake in the bread and the cup today. I'd ask that the communion stewards please come forward as we distribute the elements.
This is the body of Christ which is broken for you. Take and eat.
May they be used so this church continues to be a light in a dark world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Now let us sing our final hymn, number 593, Here I Am.
God calling you, calling you salt and light. May you go from this place to give the world a little bit of flavor and shine the good news of the gospel. That Jesus Christ came not to abolish the law, but he fulfilled it. Go and make Christians. Amen. Thank you.